This is Colin Cattell with Palisade Radio. On the line with us today is Dr. Keith Barron. Keith is an exploration geologist with over 30 years of experience in the mining sector. In 2001, he privately co-founded Aurelian Resources, which made the colossal Fruta del Norte gold discovery in Ecuador. He's also the founder of U308 Corp, a uranium exploration company. And we brought Keith on the show today to get his unique perspective on the uranium sector at a time when most uranium companies are struggling to keep alive. Keith, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. Keith, with the uranium price at around $28, $29 per pound, how far are we from putting a bottom in, in your opinion? Oh, I think that the bottom is in right now. Uh, and I think that uh, it, it's only really a circumstance of what's happening in, in Japan right now. As soon as the, the first reactor in Japan is turned back on, and uh, I think we'll see maybe uh, a, a very quick double in, in, the, uh, in the spot price of, of uranium per pound. The largest country in the world in terms of population, China is currently building 28 new nuclear reactors, increasing their total reactor count up to 48. And with many other Asian countries planning and implementing similar expansion plans in their nuclear power programs, it would lead investors to think that it's only a matter of time before the demand picks up significantly. What other catalysts are you seeing aside from Japan and new reactors in emerging markets for the uranium price? Well, you know, for many, many years now, the, um, the uranium market is, uh, has been in a deficit uh, uh, in, uh, with regards to uh, supply and demand. Uh, it hasn't been able to keep up with the demand uh, for, uh, from the energy sector. And, and what has happened is that um, over the last uh, uh, eight, ten years, there was a program in the U.S. and Russia called uh, Megatons to Megawatts, where uh, nuclear fuel uh, taken from old warheads was downblended. Uh, I mean, not nuclear fuel, but nuclear material from warheads was downblended into usable nuclear fuel. Uh, now, that program ended at the end of last year, and so there's no more material coming from uh, from the former Soviet Union, certainly there hasn't been any coming from the U.S. for, for several years now. They, that, that part of the program curtailed, I think, in 2008. Um, so, you know, really what's happened is that uh, the industry has been using uh, uranium that has been mined maybe in the 1960s and the 1950s even uh, and for consumption in, in nuclear power plants. And uh, and that's all gone now. Um, so you know this is not like the the gold business where uh, gold is always uh, you can um, uh, recast it and reuse it and and it's uh, it's really not destructed. Um, in uranium, uh, the the stuff is is uh, is used up and it's gone. So um, we've been in a deficit supply situation. That is continuing, but uh, I did mention the, the, the Japanese situation. What's happened there is that the Japanese have continued to buy uh, nuclear fuel uh, after the Fukushima incidents, uh, and they have not cur curtailed their, uh, their purchases. They kept them up every month, and there's this perception out there in the industry that should Japan not go back to nuclear, Ever that uh, there's this huge uh, supply overhang in the market. Well, the savvy people who know what's going on uh, know that it's going out the back door to China, and China has been buying from Japan. Uh, it's just not something that uh, anyone shouts about. So, uh, you know, there, there's a situation right now where uh, they're building uh, new nuclear plants in India, in the Emirates in uh, certainly a tremendous number in China, um, in Vietnam, and in, in Taiwan, many, many different countries around the world. Uh, and certainly in China, where you have this situation in places like Beijing, where the air is hardly breathable, uh, nuclear is really the only option to clean up the air, clean up the environment, and produce clean uh, and cheap energy for, uh, for their uh, their uh, certainly modernization programs, and so uh, never, 
never mind what happened with Fukushima. The uh, there was maybe a maybe a slow hiccup uh, in uh, Chinese building uh, where everything was recertified, and that happened several years ago, and now everything's going great guns again. So we are going to see a lot of consumption. Uh, a lot of new consumption of uranium coming on board, and really, um, the West is 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 going to become largely irrelevant. Uh, U.S. and and Europe, even though they're bigger consum- big consumers now, they're certainly going to be outshone by China and by India. For investors wanting to get in at the bottom in uranium, what type of uranium projects should investors look at right now? Do you prefer exploration stage companies? companies transitioning into production or producers like Cameco? Well, um, I, I think that the wise thing to do would be to, to, to spread your, uh, your um, exposure over all three, uh, but certainly uh, the juniors are where you're going to get your real leverage. And, um, you know, in the case of, of uh, the company that, uh, that I work with, U308, uh, we've just uh, done a, a preliminary economic assessment uh, to show that uh, uh, we could uh, potentially produce in the in the lowest quartile of cost for the uh, uh, for the uranium industry. And by lowest quartile, I mean in the lowest 25% uh, cost of all the industry. So this is really what you want to look at. Uh, in situations like in the Athabasca, everybody knows the Athabasca Basin and the big projects there. Cameco and Arriva both have uh, huge mines there like MacArthur River and, uh, and Cigar Lake. But these things are very, very uh, expensive things to build. And they're very expensive and take a long time to get permitted. So you, you want to look for places, uh, companies that are working in places where it's going to be relatively easy to go ahead and uh, and produce, you can fast track these things, and I think that you know should I be right and the uranium price doubles, uh, you certainly want to be able to take a, advantage of that and uh, not have to wait uh, 10 or 15 or maybe even 20 years uh, for your your permits to come through, and um, and I think U308 working in in. Uh, in Patagonia and Argentina is, is very uh, uh, a well placed to uh, take advantage of that. And you've done a good bit of work in Argentina with U308 Corp, a country that's now once again in default. Many investors do have a bit of fear about putting capital into a country that's defaulted several times over the past few years. But the government's actually very pro-nuclear, something that a lot of people don't know. Can you talk about that? Yes, and in fact, they just signed an agreement with the Chinese government to, to build uh, their fourth reactor. Um, Argentina has been a, 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 um, a nuclear country for many, many years. Uh, they did produce uh, uranium up until I think maybe 10 or 12 years ago uh, when um, the main deposits were depleted, uh, but certainly they're in a situation where they need um, they need feed. They need the raw materials uh, to run the reactors. Now, this new reactor that's going to be built is a can-do reactor, and that means that it can uh, they can use uh, uranium ore. It doesn't have to be uh, very much upgraded to uh, to go ahead and uh, and use it as nuclear fuel. And uh, we're certainly in a in a situation where uh, we can uh, we can fill that gap. Uh, now, regards to default, uh, you know, there's a lot talked about this, but really, the, the default, there, there are a bunch of vulture funds that got in at the very, very tail end of this whole scenario with the bonds, and they, um, you know, they, they represented, I think, about 3% of the creditors, and that's all. This has been really, really blown up in the media, uh, but, you know, within Argentina, it's uh, largely seen as irrelevant. And we've seen the Argentine stock market climb up uh, quite a bit over the last uh, 12 months. Uh, it doesn't seem to be affecting uh, business. And certainly the curse of government now is, uh, is starting to uh, change their tune uh, for various industries and uh, remove some of the 
uh, more punitive uh, taxes and, and royalty situations for various things. And uh, we think that uh, they're going to be uh, much, much more open uh, for business. They really do have to uh, go out and, and, and earn some money right now because potentially the bond market uh, window is going to be closed to them. Keith, what are you working on these days? You had one of the largest successes in the past 15 years in exploration with the Fruta del Norte project. Are you sitting back and enjoying life or looking for the next big find? <laughs> oh, I'm always looking for the next one. Yeah, I, I've, uh, I've got uh, several companies on the go, um, along with uh, U308. Uh, I, I'm uh, president and CEO of a company working here in Switzerland, uh, both for gold and uranium, called Arania. And uh, no, I'm... I'm I guess, you know, I, I, I hung up my boots for about three weeks and went to the beach and got bored out of my tree, and I said, that's enough of that. <laughs> I got, got back stuck in. And so, uh, um, you know, I'm very excited what's going on in, in, um, in Argentina. Uh, the boys have been finding some new, um, new deposits, uh, new resources, in, uh, in, uh, especially one... Uh, called uh, La Susana, which is potentially a kilometer squared mineralized area. So uh, it's 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 a very very exciting time uh, for for U three hundred eight. Of course, we've got other projects in Guyana and also in Colombia, uh, but our focus is in Argentina. And uh, uh, and I, I try to get down there and have a look at uh, at what the boys have found every uh, whenever I can. It's a good place for fishing, too. <laughs> well, on that note, Keith, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's been a real pleasure.